Good morning and welcome to the San Francisco Interfaith Council online briefing for community and faith partners. In today's program, USF and SFSU presidents address the Supreme Court affirmative action decision and other emerging issues in higher education. Thank you. The important and ongoing work of the San Francisco Interfaith Council would not be possible without generous funding from congregations, corporations, faith-based social service agencies, found foundations, judicatories, and supporters like you. Help us spread the word. Visit sfinterfaithcouncil.org to learn about SFIC programming and how to become a supporter. Follow SFIC on Facebook and Twitter. And subscribe to SFIC's YouTube channel to watch all of our virtual events. A bit of housekeeping. This program is being recorded. For audio and video, all participants are muted and without video to minimize distraction. For chat, you can submit a question or a comment by selecting the chat button at the bottom of your screen and sending a message to Q&A. Questions will be forwarded to the host and answered, time permitting. For closed captions, select the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and click enable live transcription. <clears throat> Now is the time to stand together, San Francisco. Together, we can stop anti-Asian discrimination, bias, hate, and violence. The COVID-19 virus has no race or nationality. It is simply a disease. To report a hate crime, call the SFPD at 415-553-1133. And at this time, I'd like to hand the floor over to the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Michael Pappas. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trey. Good morning, I'm Michael Pappas, and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I wanna welcome you to this week's online briefing for community and faith partners. In June, the United States Supreme Court declared the use of affirmative action in determining admissions decisions unconstitutional, undoing decades of work to create equitable access to higher education for students of color. This decision will likely impact other equity-driven initiatives, including scholarships, support services, and hiring practices. Its impact may ultimately be felt well outside higher education. This week's online briefing for community and faith partners hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council welcomes University of San Francisco President, Father Paul Fitzgerald, and San Francisco State University President, uh, Dr. Lynn Mahoney, who will address the consequences of the Supreme Court decision on higher education and beyond, as well as share emerging and pressing issues in higher education, such as post-pandemic fragility and student mental health, return on investment of a college degree and faculty and student work for a more green, just, and humane future. As we do at the beginning of every program, allow me to read this interfaith statement. This is an interfaith community. Whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. If we are invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without fear of offending those who come from another tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of faith traditions in our city and in our world. At this time, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Aaron Grizel. Aaron uh, is the executive director of the um, uh, NorCal MLK Foundation. We've had the privilege of working together for 13 years on the annual MLK March and interfaith service. Uh, he is a true thought leader in our community and is very invested in today's subject. And uh, Aaron, we welcome you and invite you to uh, ground us in this reflective moment. Thank you, Michael, and hello, everyone. Uh, well, great pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, only take a few minutes of your time during this, uh, during this important discussion to center our thoughts on uh, couple of things that have occurred this weekend. As we know, August 28th, 2023, 
This past Sunday represents the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. That March, we all, each one of us have, have heard numerous times about Dr. King's I have a dream speech and the ideas that were promulgated uh, during that uh, very powerful discussion. But I want to talk about something something slightly uh, uh, slightly different than than that. As as we know, uh, also this weekend marked the tragic murder of innocent African Americans, Angela Carr, Anot Laguerre, and Gerald Deshaun Galleon by the white racist hands in Jacksonville, Florida. So we have two things that went on this weekend in, in sort of a dichotomous sort of structure. Um, there is this persistence of hate and racism in our social order. But then there is coupled with that a determination to march toward the realization of justice, peace and beloved community. So we have these two ideas, almost like two freedoms that are coming at each other from opposite directions. And it shows the deep tensions that continue to fester in our country. And that tension is coming to, uh, uh, it's, it's coming to a head again and is, and is emerging and forcing us, particularly us of faith and us of, of, of sacred tradition to think about where we are in the placement of this dichotomous sort of structure and dichotomous sort of uh, heading. And in 1956, on March 18th, a 27-year-old Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered a sermon at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, entitled, When Peace Becomes Obnoxious. When Peace becomes obnoxious. And he delivered this sermon two days before he was to stand trial for his activities during the Montgomery bus boycott. But the sermon didn't have anything to do with his impending trial. It had something to do with a young lady named Arthurine Lucy, who three weeks earlier had been expelled from the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa just for attending. She was a graduate student in the library sciences, and she was the first African-American to be formally admitted into the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. A graduate student in library sciences, she entered that university having been admitted from the days before she entered to the 28 days she attended there were riots and there were protests every single day. Riots and protests every single day. Until 28 days later, the president of the university and the board of trustees, instead of speaking to the idea of fairness, decided to expel authoring Lucy permanently from the university in order to maintain peace and to bring peace back into the community. And this is where King talks about the obnoxiousness of peace. When we use peace to tamp down violence at the sacrifice of human dignity and human rights, that is an obnoxious peace. For true peace is not the absence of tension, but is, it is the presence of justice and goodwill. And if we are deciding to sacrifice that and not face up to the 
inherent tensions in our communities, then that is an obnoxious piece. And we must, um, um, in our um, beloved way, push back against this type of peace in order to confront those issues that um, are intransigent in our community in order to face them and to decide how we're going to deal with them. That was King's formula. And, and our idea of hope gives us the confidence that in coming together, we can emerge as people of, 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 of a beloved sort of framework and create solutions for ourselves to decide how we want to live as a community. And that's where the medicine for this very poison can be met by us coming together as this morning coming together to discuss difficult issues and to come together as people of goodwill, people of faith, people of sacred tradition to find responses to and answers to that particular issue. And I, for one, continue to believe in that particular formula. And I hope that all of us do too, as we listen to our University presidents, President Fitzgerald and President Mahoney talk about some of the challenges that they are facing. Let us as leaders in the faith community begin to be the ones to chart out the course for our communities going forward. Let us be the examples as we should, as those who are um, called to this type of work to be the ones to be the examples to move forward and continue to create beloved community. I certainly appreciate this time with you and look forward to this engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. And you've set the table and you've inspired us and, and you've grounded us for a conver an important conversation to come in. And we value your partnership and look forward to collaborations in the future. God bless you. It is a great privilege to welcome two very dear friends uh, who really elevate the conversation of uh, any uh, thoughts in San Francisco because uh, they are at the helms of two very, very important uh, institutions of higher learning. Uh, Father Paul Fitzgerald, president of the University of San Francisco and Dr. Lynn Mahoney, president of San Francisco State University. I have wanted to uh, welcome the two of them onto this program for a very long time. And when that Supreme Court decision came down, uh, this seemed to be the perfect time. Their remarks will not be limited uh, to just the affirmative action decision, but also to some other important decisions and, 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 and issues that we should be very conscious of today, uh, not only for San Francisco, uh, but for our world as they are forming the young leaders of tomorrow. Welcome you both. Thank you for being with us and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Michael. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I, I, I thank the Interfaith Council for creating the space to have this kind of conversation, which as Aaron suggested is critically needed. Um, let me first start by saying that actually the Supreme Court de decision didn't directly affect California's public universities. Both um, the UCs and the California State University part of which uh, San Francisco State is one, had this basically outlawed in 2000 and 1996 with the passage of Prop 209, which banned us from using not just race and ethnicity, but also um, gender and a couple of other categories for all sorts of things on a university campus, far more than admissions. So it affected the admissions of students, the recruitment and hiring of employees, scholarship support, there are, there are many, many ways. Its impact was, was on far greater than admission. Um, and so one of the things that we can talk about this morning a little bit is the kind of creative ways that, that the CSUs and the UCs have attempted to, 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 to um, remain true to their mission to provide ec educational equity to California's diverse students in that kind of a legal landscape. Um, we've had to be creative about how we give scholarships um, I know UC Davis has a program in their medical school to, to, to be creative about admissions. Um, it has required much more intentionality 
and, and a lot more work. And the results haven't been as positive. Uh, the UCs in particular saw a, uh, a fairly significant decline in student diversity when, when Prop 209 passed. Um, but in some ways, it's the larger, so, so we can all get creative and, and um, we'll hear how USF is being creative and will be creative. Um, but the implications are bigger than this. And I think Aaron alluded to it in, in, in his remarks. Um, and I'm gonna, he was far more eloquent than I could be, but you know, we can't, we, we will not have peace if we don't have justice. And educational equity is, is a key part of justice. Uh, and, and the lack of affirmative action um, undermines that, but it undermines it in a much bigger way in, the, in, in, in that um, basically what the Supreme Court justices and the opponents of affirmative action are trying to get us to believe is that race doesn't matter. Uh, for anyone who I think lives in the city of San Francisco or teaches or works at the kind of diverse institutions that, that um, Paul and I work at, uh, we know that's not true. Uh, and in, in listening to Aaron's words, achieving equity after centuries, and we're talking centuries, hundreds of years of systemic oppression will take systemic solutions. We will not have justice. We will not have peace. We will not have any of that without equity. And um, educational equity, uh, again, of course, from my lens, is the, big, the biggest thing, but, but it, it's critical to that. So, so there's that big problem. And, but then secondarily, I also wanna put this conversation in a slightly different context. Um, so while outraged by the Supreme Court decision, sadly not surprised, but outraged, um, I was also disturbed by the media conversation that followed, which kind of seemed to suggest that, you know, with affirmative action, suddenly institutions like Harvard and Stanford were accessible. <laughs> Um, they're not accessible. They're not designed to be accessible. I'm not being critical of them. I'm a Stanford alum. They have a different role. They are very elite institutions um, who will admit very few people and serve very few people. But the conversation, once again, I think neglected what I call the workhorses of educational equity, and that's San Francisco State, it's USF, it's my colleagues in the CSU system. Um, and, and, and that's actually where most of this work happens. Uh, I was very, very pleased in July when the San Francisco Chronicle ran an article that, that showed using data just that point. So San Francisco State is one of 23 California State University um, campuses from, located from San Diego to Humboldt. And we, across our 23 campuses, educate 41% of Cal California's Asian American students we educate 50% of California's Black students and 64% of California's Latinx students. The work is happening here and it's happening at, at institutions like USF. It's not happening in, in great numbers at the kind of institutions that the media focused on. I'm really deeply proud of San Francisco State within those, those, that, that data of, of the 200 or so institutions in the state of California that produce bachelor's degrees. California ranks, I'm sorry, San Francisco State ranks fourth for black student degrees um, and 12th for Asian American students and for Latinx students. So one of the conversations I think that has to follow from this is um, how, how do we as a society support the institutions that are educating these students? And, and, and um, Paul will share the demographics at USF. Our institutions look like our city. They look like our state. Um, but we can't do this. And again, without affirmative action, without with Prop 209 in place, in my case, we can't give, we, we, we can't recruit students in, in, as easily. We can't provide targeted scholarships. I have often said my greatest dream is I could wake up in the morning and offer every Black student in San Francisco um, who is eligible to go to San Francisco State a, a free ride. And I can't say that legally. So I have to find creative ways to do it. I have to partner with local organizations who can offer those scholarships. Um, I have to partner with community organizations and high schools and middle schools and elementary schools to recruit students from particular neighborhoods. So um, if, if this demonstrates, and I think Aaron ended here, and I'll, I'll end here too and pass this on to follow, Father Paul, it indicates we won't do this alone. Um, you know, as the courts tie our hands, working together. Um, to have difficult conversations, as Aaron said, and with goodwill, um, we can we can overcome this. But it is it is an enormous setback for all the work that's been done to undo centuries of systemic oppression. 
I'll pass this off to my colleague from USF. Thank, thank you, Lynn. Um, let me start uh, with a little historical footnote um, that uh, Aaron's remarks uh, pop, popped into my into my head. Um, Father John Brooks, a Jesuit priest, was the president of the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, a very fine liberal arts college, which was a white serving institution uh, up until you know, 1970. Um, just after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Father Brooks went on a tour up and down the East Coast of the United States looking for very bright black young men to bring to the College of the Holy Cross. One of them was a young Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas got a fine <laughs> Jesuit education and built a terrific career. Um, but I, I, you know, he was the beneficiary of affirmative action in, in its nascency. Uh, USF, so founded 1855, uh, by the 1920s, women were earning degrees at the University of San Francisco, but they had to enroll in the night college, the evening college. Um, the college of the U university was completely uh, racially integrated by 1930, so 24 years before Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, we do this because we're a Catholic institution. And we're a Catholic institution that sees the dignity and worth of every human person. We're a Jesuit institution, and so we, we look to those who are excluded and make room for them at the table. Um, where is uh, USF today? We are second in the nation for ethnic diversity, but ethnic diversity by the federal um, definition is, is a, a poor definition to really embrace the breadth of, of humanity in, in all of our wonderful beauty. So uh, there, students at the University of San Francisco come from 23 different faith traditions and practice those faith traditions here. Uh, the Interfaith Council is a wonderful partner as we can find communities of support for our students across the city. Um, students speak 50 different languages at home and come from uh, over 100 different countries. Um, as I welcome uh, new students to the university, I say, you know, what do you have in common? Uh, and, and the answer is your noble humanity. So let's bring that to the surface in, in each other uh, by engaging in the long, hard work uh, of social justice. And as I say, we're, we're diverse and equitable and inclusive coming out of our Catholic tradition. Um, and, you know, in a little uh, piece that I wrote after the Supreme Court decision, you know, if the government were to say that we, you know, we can't look at the characteristics of our students, those immutable characteristics, uh, whether it's their gender expression, um, the, the color of their skin, the, their religion, uh, well, religion is a little mutable, but <laughs> and, you know, this is part of our mission is to bring together humanity so that we might build that that beloved community um, to which Aaron invited us. Um, let me just, you know, talk a little bit about when I got here nine years ago, uh, USF was doing quite well with our Latino, Latina students, with um, Asian American Pacific Islander students, with our white students but we were not attracting very many black identified students. We were only about 4% of our entering classes um, and half of them were transferring away. Um, they were academically quite gifted, but they just weren't feeling the love. Um, so we went out and studied other universities that were doing a very good job um, recruiting and retaining black identified students. And we put together base, uh, black achievement success and engagement. Uh, after several years, you know, now we're 14, 15% of entering classes are black identified and our black students are succeeding at the same rate as everyone else. Um, so we were quite intentional. Uh, now the Supreme Court ruling doesn't affect us uh, immediately because we don't use race or ethnicity as a particular factor in admission. We draw a line and we admit everyone who's above the line. Um, we're blessed to have a very diverse pool of applicants. Uh, and then we accept all those who we feel uh, will thrive here academically, intellectually, socially. And then the ones who do come do thrive. Uh, and, and so, you know, the Supreme Court ruling doesn't affect our admissions policies. We also do not have a legacy um, policy. So uh, if your grandmother uh, went here, you know, you don't get extra points, uh, although she'd probably write you a really good letter of recommendation. Um, 
But I am concerned about um, scholarships. So one of the ways we turned our, our situation around in terms of service of our black students is um, we uh, advertise uh, 10 uh, black scholars uh, every year will receive a full ride at the University of San Francisco. And we get you know, more than 100 applicants of brilliant, talented young people from across the country. And we fly a whole bunch of them out uh, for interviews and a visit to campus. And then, yeah, 10, 10 will receive this black scholarship. Uh, and then many of the others who were semifinalists do enroll with presidential scholarships or provost level scholarships. Uh, and it has really enriched the, the education of every member of our community, this sort of diversity. Uh, will we have to change, you know, how, how we word some of these things? Will we have to change? I don't, I don't know yet. Um, but were the government to interfere with this? I would say that it's, it's an imposition and it's an interference with our religious freedom because we are doing, you know, we educate the students we want to educate and we educate them in a certain way uh, so that they will be, as I like to say, permanently dissatisfied with the status quo for the rest of their lives and be agents of change. Um, uh, you know, and we'll figure out ways to continue to do that, even if the government does try to interfere with our religious mission. And I'll, I'll stop with that. That is a great jumping off point, uh, Father Paul and, uh, and, and Lynn. I, I've been very, very concerned about legislation in uh, some of the red states uh, uh, dictating what, can, what curriculum can be taught uh, in schools there, uh, as well as what books can be or not be in libraries. What, what challenges does that pose to you for students coming from those states to your universities? Um, so at, at USF, we work very hard to foster uh, dialogue among, as I, as, I, as I said, an amazingly diverse community of young people coming from many different places, many different cultures, many different, and uh, you know, orchestrating, um, was it um, running a university is not like conducting a symphony orchestra, it's more like running a jazz combo, you know, faculty kind of doing their own things and you try to make it harmonious. Um, we have, we stress over and over again that, you know, our students are encountering each other with curiosity and, and and respect and even a sense of reverence and awe, uh, and and for all of them, uh, entrance entrance into college, every college, uh, San Francisco State, USF, entrance into college is a big leap forward for an eighteen year old person. Uh, for our masters and doctoral students, it's a big leap into a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of feeling, a whole new way of being a person uh, in community with others, uh, and you know. DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is, is essential, but it's a starting point. The equity has to be really experienced on a daily basis that everyone has access to the resources. Everyone, ha everyone has access to the conversation, you know? Um, everybody raises their hand and everybody gets called on. Uh, and then inclusion, you know, inclusion. Uh, People need to feel uh, that they are they have a seat at the table and that they're part of this family. And then part of you know co college is letting go, letting go of probably some old ideas uh, that they've heard when they were children, uh, that they may have heard on the street corner, that they may have heard even in church. Letting go of some ideas that no longer match their growing complexity, their growing sophistication, their growing ability to see. Um, society, our North American society, um, as it actually is with its strengths and with its weaknesses, with those perhaps competing worldviews of, uh, you know, as Karl Mannheim, one of my favorite sociologists, uh, Karl Mannheim in his book, Ideology and Utopia, says, you know, the people at the top of the social pyramid, they tend to be, um, you know, ideologists. They say, well, everything is the way it should be. This is the best of all possible worlds. Nothing should change because I happen to be at the top of the pyramid. And the people at the bottom of the pyramid say, the whole system is broken. The whole system is rigged against me and against us. So the whole system should fall apart. And we have to move you know, from these extremes towards the center where we're gonna be progressively making society better every day. Um, again, the Supreme Court uh, deci you know, decision 
um, is based on a fantasy that you know, racism is done. We've achieved, you know, um, th th this post-racial uh, society. It's not, we're not there. We have so much work to do, as Aaron reminded us in, in his beautiful introduction. You know, the evil of, the sin of racism uh, is evident on a daily basis. Let, let me just jump in and, and add two things. First, this actually, the, the, the it's not just the assault on K through 12 content or college content, right? It's also on the ability to have an equity and diversity office or a team on, on your campuses in these states. Um, I, I think it actually could be a, a boon for USF, San Francisco State, and San Francisco. Um, we are we are a haven for these for the students who 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 are uncomfortable in those states and unwelcome in those states. So, uh, you know, on our campus, we're expecting and we're seeing kind of a bump in students from the LGBTQ plus communities in other states who want to come to San Francisco to study. Um, so, so that's the first thing. The other thing, and I'm glad you brought this up, Michael, because while we've been focused on the Supreme Court decision and who's going to get into Harvard, right, um, the assault that those states are putting on um, the right of colleges to do anything is absolutely shocking, absolutely shocking. And again, I think it is a hidden assault on trying to undo the equity uh, the momentum that that our, our drive for equity has has those uh, those states are also weaponizing the word woke. Um, and if we could take a moment, I, I would love to hear your understanding of the word woke. And is it true that most college professors are liberals and pushing a woke agenda? I'm at, I'm at an institution that, that is rather famous for its activism. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so uh, I'll jump in. Um, um, is it true that I, I do think that, that the, the kind of dominant culture on most college campuses leans liberal? Yes. Was that true when I was in college 40 years ago? Yes. Um, and some of that has to do with educating young people who come and are, are highly... Um, um, idealistic and 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 want to and change want to change the world and of course when I was in college liberal hadn't yet been defined as a bad word right as something that was negative so on the one hand um, I, I don't I think free speech is alive and 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 complex thinking is alive on campuses more than 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 most think it is I think it's an agenda of right wing media to paint campuses the way they do to to undermine faith in education. Right, they've under, the, the 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 far right in the last twenty years, or even just the last ten, say, has undermined faith in government, faith in science. I saw yesterday a statistic on folks who have never attended college and those with higher education, and do you believe in climate change? It was astounding the difference. Um, so I think this is just one more assault on institutions, and they're using the kind of the liberal bent that universities have all, always had um, to do that. And so I think we should be very careful about not participating in the um, exaggeration of the extent to which free speech and free thinking is dead on college campuses. Um, it, it's still there. Yesterday, I, you know, we yesterday I on my campus we had on one side of the quad Turning Point, which is a very far right student organization with big down with socialism posters, and then I had. I don't know, 35 feet away, the Young Democrat, uh, Democratic Socialists of America with their don't raise tuition, end capitalism, you know, make everything free. And nobody had a fight. No, nobody exchanged words. There was no conflict. That's never going to make the paper that the far right and the far left were on a college quad together. But if they can be on a college quad together at San Francisco and not, 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 not come into conflict, you can do it anywhere. Yeah, I agree with everything Lynn just said. Um, what does the word woke mean? If it means that I see you and I recognize you as a human being and I affirm your, your dignity and your inalienable worth, and therefore I have to kind of maybe examine some of my filters, some of my biases, to be able to create that space where the two of us can encounter each other, um, that's a good thing. <laughs> if that's wokeness, you know, if wokeness is um, you can't ever challenge me with an idea that might push me off of, you know, out of my biases. No, that, but that's not what college is about. College is about discovering, you know, academic freedom was born at my alma mater, the University of Paris, uh, after the Treaty of Westphalia, 
with the rise of the nation states in Europe and the faculty at the University of Paris were getting pressure from the King of France to become an agent and an agency for the nation to, to study, promote and teach, you know, what's good for France is true. And they said, that's not who we are. That's not what a university is. A university is about the discovery of new truth, the discovery of new knowledge and the dissemination of the knowledge directly to our students and indirectly to society. So the faculty in Paris appealed to the Pope <laughs> and said, would you please protect us from the king who's trying to censor us and, 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 and funnel us in a certain a utilitarian direction for the usefulness of the state. And the Pope did. So academic freedom is, uh, you know, the, the right of, and the guarantee of the freedom of the most, I know, I wouldn't say that faculty are the, the most intelligent people uh, in, the, in, in society. They're among the most intelligent people. They just happen to be people who fell in love with school in the fourth grade and never left, right? And so, you know, uh, freedom, uh, academic freedom is about that freedom both to, to, to teach, but also to research and write and discover and to dream of a better future, right? Where science is pushed forward, technology is pushed forward, art is pushed forward, literature is pushed forward. You know, everything that is that, that celebrates what it is for human beings and human beings are not static beings, you know, we're, we're progressive beings from generation to generation to generation. You know, we, we continue to learn more about nature we continue to learn more about, you know, the, the artificial worlds of, of mathematics uh, that we've created, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, all these things. And it requires a constant questioning, you know, it requires a constant questioning. So again, if, if, if wokeness is simply a description of a beloved community where everyone is seen and respected, I'm all for it. <laughs> if it's, um, you know, don't challenge me, don't make me uncomfortable in my pre-existing certitudes, then it doesn't belong. It, it's not part of higher education. Uh, it, uh, I am absolutely confident that higher education, despite these, um, these attacks, you know, all of the studies, all of the really good clinical studies show that a college education sets you up for, you know, a much better career track it also sets you up for better marital outcomes. It sets you up for more civic engagement. It sets you up for a much smoother midlife crisis. <laughs> Higher education, because you know you're gonna you're gonna read theology. You're gonna ask the great philosophical questions. <laughs> you're you're gonna be part of a community of inquiry, and, and these become habits that you you don't lose. So, um, you know, we have a you know, a shrinking percentage of our young people who are going to college over these last few years, the pandemic, you know, the, the, the tale of the pandemic, you know, is, is going to be with us for a while. Um, but, you know, there, there, there is no doubt that colleges and universities are and will long remain uh, engines uh, for a better future for individuals and for society. I'd like to come back to the pandemic in a moment, but we have a couple of questions from our attendees. Uh, one is from Kevin. It says, how can the presidents present, ensure difficult issues be discussed without fighting? The Riley Gaines event devolved because a campus group shut down the event. How can you ensure different ideas are welcome to be expressed freely? So that, that was at San Francisco State last April. Um, and first, just to put that in context, um, I have had 25,000 students enrolled last April and 50 were involved in um, trying to interrupt a speaker. So just to keep it in perspective, I had 24,000 students who let, let the speak, were, were not engaged in negative behavior, the kind of the negative consequences of, 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 of wokeness. Um, so, so two things. In that instance, the speaker was able to speak and it was protesters gaining access to a, a, a corridor. And, and that was a failure on my part and the failure of my university to keep the corridor clear. Um, and uh, prior to that, for the time that she spoke, there actually was a conversation and there was silent protest in the room. There were folks in the room who were just there and, and they were not engaging, but they were they were not engaging negatively either. But there actually had been some conversation. Um, and so I think, first of all, it, it, it behooves university presidents to constantly send a, a message out of free speech and th that, that these speakers have a right to be and also to promote the kind of values that, that Paul talked about, which is you're, you're here to sometimes be made uncomfortable. You're here to um, 
uh, hear things you may not want to hear. But by the same token, I, I also feel strongly, and, and this was particularly true in the case of Riley Gaines, some speakers aren't coming to have a conversation either. They're coming to voice their own agenda. And they have every right to do it, and universities have every right to make sure that they can do that. But at the same token, sometimes what they say is deeply hurtful and more than hurtful, even existential. So San Francisco State has a very large LGBTQ plus population, a significant number of trans students. And for them, this was not a conversation. This is an existential crisis. This is a group of people who don't want them to exist or don't want them to participate. So I also feel an equal responsibility to uh, making sure that, that they get seen, that they get heard, and that they get the support they need when someone is coming to campus. So I, I would say university presidents have a very hard job of, of doing all of these things at the same time. And I, I do think you've seen very clearly across the United States support for free speech. Um, and in the week after Riley Gaines, I sent out several campus messages um, and um, imploring students and uh, to allow speakers. And the following week, we had an equally controversial speaker come to campus without any, any, um, any issues. So um, yeah, we have, a, we have a right to, to give them the space, but I also think sometimes speech is hurtful. I, I support their right to do it, but you have to address the hurt as well. Oh, well, yeah, certainly we, we support you know, faculty who want to bring um, challenging speakers to campus, you know, some of our centers, you know, want to bring in uh, folks who are challenging, you know, we continue to go back to, you know, what is, what is our mission, you know, what is our culture, uh, and, you know, how, how can we be partners in, in advancing this mission and this culture. I think every faculty member in each classroom, you know, has to curate that conversation and, and lead students to a place where they truly can hear each other and maybe disagree with each other. You know, our, our Jewish Student Association will prepare and, and serve the feast to end the Ramadan fast for our Muslim students. You know, there's, if, they, if they're gonna talk about Middle Eastern politics, it'll, there'll be disagreements, there'll be strong disagreements and they can, you know, muster uh, facts and, 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 and uh, arguments um, and, and have that conversation. But, you know, and then for, for more formal protesting, we have, a, you know, rules about time, manner and place. So, you know, yes, you can, you can pamphlet, you can leaflet, you can table, you can, you know, but you can't interfere with classrooms. You can't interfere with academic programs. Um, we did have a disturbance on campus last year. We had the consuls general of Vietnam, the Philippines, Singapore, and Malaysia to have a panel discussion on the upcoming APEC conference. And um, the room was filled with uh, USF folks. Um, and then a group of protesters came in um, including a member of the Interfaith Council who will remain nameless here. Um, but their, their purpose was not to engage the speakers with some hard questions. Their purpose was to disrupt and, and end the conference. Uh, and that's what happened. I found it disappointing, but I also found it, you know, you know this, this is the first time in nine years that I've seen this on campus. And it was by people who are really not members of our community and, and not imbued with the values uh, of our community. So I, I think that it's the long run, right? It's the long run. As you establish a culture, um, you know, where the 25,000 all are like listening to each other and, and entering into this process of discovery and engagement and, you know, allowing themselves to be made uncomfortable by having a more complex and, you know, view of reality. And it's the 50, you know, who maybe in their youthful exuberance um, get a little get a little ahead of themselves. Uh, and that happens here. Yeah. And let, me, let me say, though, um, you know, um, the, I in the wake of this faculty held teach ins, we have 400 students pack a theater to learn more. So I, in an odd kind of way, when you have these disturbances, it actually then promotes conversation. Yeah, yes. And I would just say, uh, in the spirit of uh, Lynn's 50, uh, that we have 800 communities of faith and religious institutions that count themselves as our constituents, and I was not the person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aaron asks a very important question. What are the ways you are helping admitted students tackle the higher cost of uh, San Francisco? Well, okay, so we, um, uh, higher cost of living in San Francisco, we... We can house about 3,200 students on campus. We have uh, limited graduate student housing off campus at St. Anne's in the Sunset, for example. Um, we have an office of off-campus living. 
Um, and uh, she's a former realtor and she is great at helping our students find affordable housing uh, in the city. There are a lot of landlords who like to rent to our students because they know they're going to be here for a few years and then they're going to go home. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then we have a food pantry on campus. You know, we have all, we have limited, but, but real resources to make sure that everybody has, you know, the essentials. Um, and, uh, but I will say, maybe it's not so much the cost of living in San Francisco, but it's just the, the um, right now, the way the press is beating up San Francisco. We do have one of the lowest rates of violent crime for any big city in the country. Unemployment is at two and a half percent. You know, uh, the tech workers who are laid off, they take a two month vacation and then they go out and they get a, a killer job in, in a week. <laughs> so you know, San Francisco arts, um, you know, our diversity, our engagement, the, the cultural richness of the city. San Francisco is an awesome place to come and get an education. And certainly San Francisco State, USF, you know, they're great universities where you're going to get an education, but also the city is, is an extension of our campuses. Um, so, you know, we make it work for our students in terms of the essentials of life, but the city helps us to deliver a world-class education. So, so we, we also suffer from the same two problems. First, this, the, the, the public relations. When I met with new parents at move-in weekend back in August, the thing they kept saying about the San Francisco state was, it's so beautiful. I, you know, the, the grounds are beautiful. I don't see a lot of unhoused people. You know, they have this vision that I don't know what their vision is. And then they come to the city and they see it's not true. But, you know, most of, most of my students, uh, many of my students are very low income, very, very low income. So the cost of housing is an issue. And, um, it, it, and it's an issue, and I'm sure it's the same for, for USFs, for my faculty and my staff. Mm. It's a very big employee issue. So the state did do something that I hope they do more of in the future. Um, so a, a California State University degree is very affordable, very affordable if you live at home with your parents or with your family. If you throw in the cost of housing, housing is two or three times the cost of actually the tuition. And this is different for, from a private institution. And so the state a couple of years ago, about three years ago, realized that if they really want to make um, the public universities affordable, they have to start supporting housing as well, because they weren't supporting housing at all. That was, I had to build housing the same way a private university would, with, you know, with, 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 with debt, and then charge the students to pay off the debt. So they put aside um, a couple of billion dollars for the UCs, the community colleges and the CSUs, the bulk toward community colleges. Uh, and then they sent out a call for proposals, you know, who has a need for housing and who is shovel ready with a project. And um, the Department of Finance said San Francisco State among the CU CSUs have the greatest need for housing because of the cost of housing here. And at that, uh, and even currently, I think I can house about 4,600 students or something, 4,500. So we received, um, 115 million, 135, I used to know that number, um, uh, from the state, to, which will pay for about 65% of the cost of housing. So we will actually be charging students who would typically, it'll open in fall of 24, and we would typically charge a, a new low-income student about $12,000 for housing for the year. This will cost 9,000. And we have for our lowest income students, once they get their, their Pell Grants and their state grants and all of that, they still have about a $7,000 gap. This reduction in housing makes that gap 3,500. And that's something a student can work part-time and make. So we're trying to do all sorts of things. I'm gonna ask Father Paul to, to follow up on this because I there's a great success story in all of this. Uh, Father Paul has been a leader in the interfaith uh, Council's uh, uh, Essential Housing Task Force. And uh, many, many years ago, uh, uh, I had uh, the good fortune of visiting with uh, an exchange program director uh, who was housed out of St. Anne's. And, um, and uh, they were looking to repurpose the property there. I call Father Paul, and uh, maybe you could tell the St. Anne's story because I have to tell you, in the end, I, I was there with the, the nuns who used to live in that convent and neither of us uh, recognized the facility. But if you could just share that little story, because I think it's germane to what Aaron is asking. Um, so and Michael, thank you, because you're the one who made this connection for us. So uh, you know, I, I am deeply grateful. Um, yeah, so St. Anne's in the sunset, beautiful uh, church. Um, once upon a time had a, a very large uh, Catholic elementary school and a three-story convent where the sisters of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, lived. 
some of them uh, taught at other schools and would come and live in that convent during the summers when they were doing their master's degrees at USF. Um, so that that convent has a lot of uh, sentimental value to the sisters of the presentation, who are our next door neighbors here on Turk Boulevard. Um, so yeah, after Mike made that introduction, we entered into conversation with the uh, the pastor and the parish council and parish finance council, and took a long term uh, lease on the second and third floors of this rather large convent, and transformed it into uh, housing. I think three or four. Uh, larger bedrooms for married couples, and then the rest are single, uh, and for our law students. And so um, about 54 first-year law students uh, will get their, their first housing there at St. Anne's. And um, it's been a terrific way also to build community. So it's only about a third of our entering law class, but uh, they're, they're oftentimes the people who came from far away uh, to start law school here. Um, and um, the larger project, um, you know, we early on identified 700 parcels across San Francisco that are owned by religious communities. Many of them really underutilized, really underutilized uh, pieces of real estate, a, a surface level parking lot that's full 4% of the time. You know, uh, so St. Agnes, for example, they were able to leverage uh, their parking lot and it's now a, three levels of classrooms for, uh, a private school next door and underground parking. The parish and the school share the parking. Guess who needs it on the weekdays? Guess who needs it on the weekends? It works out really well. So these partnerships um, that the Interfaith Council is brokering uh, are coming up with some great solutions um, across the city. Uh, and uh, uh, we're deeply grateful. Thank you, Father Paul. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, I don't think you were here a week uh, and you invited our entire board to lunch uh, to showcase and to meet your uh, Office of Diversity. I know, Father Paul, uh, your former director of diversity was on our board, and now uh, your director of the Leo T. McCarthy Institute is on our board. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about those offices and your vision for their vision and, and how they're making a difference on your campuses. Yeah, they're very important. That's why I think it's so frightening that other governors are outlawing the ability for universities to have these offices. So we have a, an office of equity and community inclusion. I think some of my colleagues are, are on this with me today, here today. And um, it houses our uh, cultural, ethnic, racial belonging centers. And so we have the, I'm going to forget one and I'll hear about it later, but we have the Black Unity Center, the Latinx Center, the Asian American Student Services Center, um, it also houses our interfaith work, our Muslim student life coordinator, our um, Jewish student life coordinator, our Dreamers Resource Center is also under there. And um, this is the place the students can go for resources. Again, I, you know, I can't have a, an advising center or something that's just funded for Black students, for example, right? But I can have these cultural centers. And um, they often provide not just a cultural home, but an academic home. They give advice on financial aid or where you go get help. Um, you know, I, I have a large university, almost 25,000 students, and they provide a family. They're, 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 they provide a, a living room for, for students. And um, and then, of course, the work they do together. You, you know, Father Paul mentioned, um, and I think so did you, Michael, um, uh, you know, issues sometimes between um, Arab students and Jewish students or the Palestinian community and the Jewish community. When you pull out the politics and you're talking about interfaith work, the kind of work you talked around about, about Ramadan, Father Paul, um, it, it builds relationships. So just yesterday we had an interfaith uh, ice cream social on the quad at noon. Uh, and I've been very grateful for, for the support that the Interfaith Council has shown for our work. But these are very important centers that help students graduate. Father Paul? So, yes, we, we too then, you know, we have the cultural centers uh, who support, you know, the identity uh, affiliate, what we call them, um, affinity groups, um, students who, who, who uh, want to celebrate, you know, the cultures of Central America or students who want to celebrate, you know, the Philippines and the, and the many cultures from the Philippine islands that, that, that are here present on, on campus. And uh, we have an office of, uh, we're calling it ADE now, so anti-racism, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, because in addition to creating this campus community of inclusion and respect, we, we want to prepare our students to go out into the community to be agents of peace and agents of justice. 
Um, uh, Michael, you mentioned the Leo T. McCarthy Center. So Leo T. McCarthy, former Lieutenant Governor, former uh, Speaker of the Assembly, you know, a man who had, did so much uh, for the state of California, a USF alum. Uh, and before his death, he set up a bequest um, to, to found a center where, so every single one of our undergraduate students does at least one community engaged learning course where they're taking a sociology class, but they're also down at St. Anthony's or they're taking a, a, you know, a politics class and they're in city hall. Uh, and the idea there is to kind of, how do you teach compassion <laughs> and how do you teach um, thoughtful uh, and, and learned compassion where you're doing the actual social analysis and, and seeing the mechanisms that are keeping communities, you know, uh, marginalized. Um, our, our ultimate goal is to awaken in some of our students a vocation of public service uh, professionally after they graduate. So we have internships in City Hall, we have inter summer internships in Sacramento, semester long internships in Washington, DC. And, uh, uh, you know, we hope and expect um, that, you know, just, you know, Kevin, uh, was it Kevin Mullen, you know, USF alum, you know, we want our students, some, we want all of them to vote. <laughs> uh, and we do pretty well, but 55, 60% uh, voted in the last election. Um, and we want them to be civically engaged uh, citizens, you know, in, in, the, in the future. And you do that, I think, by weaving that vocation into as much as you can into every major, um, every minor, but especially in the core, the core curriculum. Thank you both. We're coming to the end of our time and we we have a number of other questions. I, I wish we could get to them. I will send them to uh, our, our presenters uh, uh, and at their, if they have the ability to respond, that would be wonderful. I'd like to just ask one last question. I, I remember when I first began this position, I was at a luncheon for the Millennium Development Goals at USF. And what impressed me was uh, the question that students were asked when they entered USF, and that is, how are you going to make the world a better place? Um, and I know that that is probably uh, prevalent in both of your uh, in both of your institutions of higher learning. With all of the challenges San Francisco is going through today, I'm wondering how you would answer that question with a specific focus on San Francisco uh, while the students are there and after they graduate. Go ahead, Lynn. That's a, that's a big one. You know, what I always ask students when I meet with new stu students, and I, I um, and our students all come to change the world too. I actually ask them to start locally. And so whenever I speak with new students, I always conclude with that I have a challenge for them. How are they going to leave San Francisco State a better place than they found it? It's kind of like chunking up this agenda. And um, I get interesting answers. So we've, they've done a lot of work on ending single use plastics. Our students voted to charge themselves, all of them a fee. And in turn, we that they, 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 they pay that to the city and they all ride Muni for free. So one of the big draws of coming to San Francisco State is built into your fees. And the students did this, not the administration, the students did this uh, to encourage people to use public transportation. And that gets them out into the big, beautiful city that is the lab we work in. So um, I, 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 I think um, focusing on San Francisco is a great idea. Um, a few years ago, uh, you know, we oh, since the 1970s, we had been really greening our campus, you know, more and more re renewable energy, more, you know, efficient buildings. And a few years ago, we, we got really close to carbon neutrality. And really, the only thing that was keeping us, you know, out of balance was um, transportation, you know, people flying on airplanes, people driving to work. So we, we charge people to park, but we subsidize, you know, mass transit. But then, you know, we, we said, okay, we're just going to pay, you know, a few, you know, $30,000 to buy carbon offsets. So we're planting trees and we're capping landfills and we're, you know, we're doing good things. You know, there's only one atmosphere. <laughs> we all breathe the same air. So the ocean water is finally all, all more or less mixed. Um, but we achieved carbon neutrality. And when, the, when we told the students that the university was carbon neutral, they became so excited and they, they became much more conscious of their use of water, more conscious of their use of electricity, because now they were like tipping us into carbon negativity, right? Where we're actually a carbon sink. We have a farm in Bolinas, uh, an organic farm, and we teach the students how to you know, eat in a way <laughs> um, through, through our dining commons 
where, where they have a really small carbon footprint. And once they could see that they're part of the solution rather than part of the problem, you could see the joy in their faces, you know? Um, and, and so, yeah, it can be the most practical thing of turning out of turning off a light, <laughs> uh, taking Muni uh, instead of an Uber, uh, little things. Thank you both. And thank you, Aaron. Uh, and uh, uh, Lynn, you paraphrased um, Pericles, the great Athenian statesman, when you said, leaving, leaving the world a better place than you found it is the sign of a good citizen. Thank you for creating good citizens. Thank you for your important work, all three of you, and God bless you. This brings today's program to a close. Stay tuned for future programming and updates.